Hello everybody and welcome to this Firebase Fundamentals video where I'm going to show you how to get up and running quickly using Firestore in your web application. Now this video assumes that you have already gotten started with the initial Firebase setup using something like Webpack or Rollup as David has described in his Getting Started video. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I recommend you check out his video first and then come on back to this one before continuing. And if you are looking for like a more detailed explanation around some of the things I'm doing, how Firestore really works underneath the hood, or like the difference between a document and a collection, uh, I would recommend that you check out the Getting Started Firecast that will be a little more detailed and should be available sometime after I make this video. And when it is, we will link to it in the description below. All right, I guess that's enough preamble for now. Let's get coding. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and start with a nearly empty project, kind of like what David had at the end of his video. So I have my code here in index.js, which then gets compiled to my main JS file, which I am reading in here. Now for testing purposes, I'm going to go ahead and call npx webpack dash dash watch to automatically compile everything that I'm sort of changing in here. And then I will serve up what's in my disk directory so that I can test it. Uh, I'm going to do that by using the npm serve command here, but you know you could also do this using Firebase serve as well. Either way is good. Uh, so let me uh, make a quick change to my code. I'll refresh my page here, and yes, looks like that change got captured and served over, so uh, we are good to go. Okay, so to get started using Firestore in your project, you'll first want to go to the Firebase console, uh, head on over to the Firestore tab, and click this Create Database button. You're going to select your initial set of security rules and your database location. For me, that's US West. And then once that's done, you will go back to your web project. Now, um, if you've already installed the latest version of Firebase using NPM, you should already have all the libraries you need. So at the top of your code, you'll just want to start importing from the Firebase slash Firestore library. Now, if you're not going to be taking advantage of any of the real-time listeners, offline support, or some of the latency compensation that our client SDKs provide, then you could also use the Firebase Firestore slash Lite library. Now, this library only lets you perform simple CRUD operations, but is significantly smaller in size. Uh, for now, though, I'm going to stick to the full library. Then to access Firestore, just call get Firestore in your code sometime after you've called initialize app. Uh, you can also use Initialize Firestore if you need to initialize Firestore with any non-default settings, kind of like this, but I am going to use the simpler Get Firestore for now. Uh, now you should also note that as I'm doing this, I'm going to need to import this function up above. Um, I'll be honest, a few weeks ago, my IDE was doing all this for me and I almost never had to worry about it, but shortly after I updated it, it mysteriously stopped automatically importing for me. Uh, no idea why, but for now, I'm going to be adding all these imports manually, and you'll probably need to make sure either that you are doing the same or that your IDE is importing these individual functions for you. Now to write to a document, you're first going to start with a document reference, and to create one of these, you will call the doc function, pass in your reference to Firestore, and then the path to your document. Now, paths in Firestore always take the form of collection, document, collection, document, and so on, which means document paths should always have an even number of elements. First the collection, then the document, then the subcollection, and so on. So in this case, I'm going to be writing to the you know, 2021-09-14 document in the daily special collection. Now, this document here is using an absolute path, but you can also use relative paths by calling doc, passing in your initial document reference, and then a path to a child off of that document reference, like so. Okay, to write to a document, you're going to use the set doc command. Uh, you'll pass in the reference to the document, which we created up above, as well as the document data that you want to write, which I will just add up above here. Generally speaking, you're going to represent your document as an object consisting of key value pairs, kind of like this. So uh, let me just call this function really quick. I'm going to run my code, and I can see my document there in the Firebase console. Now this set doc command will write the document if it doesn't exist, and it will completely replace any document that already exists at this location. Now if that's not the behavior you want, the update doc function will only overwrite the fields that you specify while keeping all your old data in place. However, this update doc call will throw an error if the document doesn't already exist. And if that's not the behavior you want, you can use the set doc command with merge true passed in as your third argument. This will create the document if it doesn't exist and only replace the fields that you've specified if it does. Um, which call you use really depends on what behavior you want from your app. Now, writing to a document is an asynchronous call that returns a promise. So you could put this in an async await call with appropriate error checking, of course. 
or you can use a dot then callback. Uh, just keep in mind in both situations that this call will only continue after the write has been confirmed by the server, even though it will be written locally to your cache. So be careful here. Don't block the UI or anything while you're waiting for this call to complete, because if your user is offline while they're using your app, it will look like your application is frozen. And to be clear, most of the time you won't need to wait for this write to be confirmed before you start using it. Because of some fancy latency compensation that our SDK already does, you'll be able to access this new data right away without actually having to wait for it to be confirmed by the server. Okay, very often you'll want to add a new document to a collection without having to specify the document ID like I did above. In those kind of situations, you can use the add doc call. This will create a new document in your collection with a randomly generated ID. Note that when you do this, you're going to be calling add doc with a collection reference instead of a document reference. But other than that, the call looks pretty similar to set doc. Uh, I guess the other difference is that this call will return a document reference to the document that has been created in case you want to know the ID or the path of the document that you just added. To read in a single document, use the get doc command, passing in the document reference for the document that you want to read. Now this returns a promise which resolves to a document snapshot, which is basically an object that represents your document. With this snapshot, you can get some metadata about the document, make sure the underlying document really exists, and most importantly, grab the data that it contains by calling data on it. So that's what I'm going to do in this example. I'll see if my document exists, and if it does, I will extract my data like so and print out a stringified version of it to the console. So just note that exists and data here are both methods, not properties. That's messed me up more than I care to admit. And uh, while this is nice, one of the really great things about Firestore is that it can also let you know in real time when your document has changed. So let's look at how to do that with a snapshot listener. To read a document in real time, you will use the on snapshot call. You'll pass in the reference of the document that you want to listen to, as well as the listener itself, which is a function that takes in a snapshot reference and does something interesting with the data. In my case, I'll once again check to see if the document exists and then print it out to the console. Note that this listener will fire the very first time you set up your snapshot listener, as you can see here, and then also fire any time thereafter when your document changes. Like if I were to change the price or the description of my daily special like this, you can see that the listener gets called again. Since leaving a listener open does involve network usage for your users and database costs for you, I do recommend disabling your listeners when you no longer need the data from this document. Now, usually that's going to be during unloading type of moments in your framework's router event or like a component's lifecycle. Although uh, if you are using Firebase's own React Fire or Angular Fire libraries, they already handle a lot of this for you. But to do this yourself, the on snapshot listener automatically returns a function that you can call to unsubscribe from that listener. Just keep that return value in a variable somewhere and then call it at the appropriate time. So being able to read in a single document is useful, but often you'll want to grab multiple documents at once. And you'll do this by creating a query. And to create a query, you will call query and then pass in a list of constraints for that query. Now, the most common queries are ones where you're searching for a certain set of documents in a single collection. So you will generally pass in a collection reference as the first constraint, meaning that you're going to be querying against that particular collection. Now, whatever else you pass in is up to you. Often there will be a WHERE clause to grab, for instance, all orders where the drink type equals latte. You could add an ORDER BY clause as well, where we could sort by the order time or the customer name. Uh, note, however, that this specific case of filtering on one field and then sorting by another will require my setting up a custom index, which Firestore will helpfully point out to me in the console through this error message. I can just click on that link and I can create the index. I can also limit my query to say the first 10 or the last 20 results that come in. And I do recommend that you set some sort of limit to make sure you're not loading in more data than your customer would reasonably want. Uh, particularly as your database grows and your collections get very large. This will save them data usage and it will save you money. Now once you've built your query, you can retrieve your documents by making a get docs call. That's docs with an S and passing in your newly created query. This function is very similar to the get doc call described earlier, except you'll be getting back a query snapshot instead of a document snapshot. Now, a query snapshot will contain an array of documents that were returned by the query, which you can get at by calling the docs method. Or if you want to iterate over them one at a time, we let you call for each directly on the query snapshot. Either way, you can then get at your document data by calling the data method on the individual documents that you've retrieved, like so. And uh, whoops, looks like I'm getting nothing here. 
Um, oh, that's because these searches are case sensitive and latte should have a capital L. All right, that's better. And by the way, this is probably a good time to remind you that all this time through the magic of editing, I have been adding all these functions, get docs, query, even query constraints like limit and order by to my imports as I need them. Now this all plays into the nice tree shakableness of the new Firebase SDK, which leaves your users with less code to download once it's been bundled up. And as we add more features over time, they'll stay out of your app until you decide you explicitly want to use them. But if I were to forget to include one of these or my ID weren't auto including them properly, I'd be getting errors like this, where it's saying things like limit is not defined and that's why. Oh, also I'm just gonna remove this bit here since we no longer need it. And queries support real-time updates as well. Basically, all you need to do here is call on snapshot and pass in your query instead of a document reference. And then in your listener callback, you'll once again receive a query snapshot and you can process it the same way you would as if you had called get docs. Here, uh, I guess let me do it a little more functional programmery with a map function. All right, there we go. And as before, this returns a function that you can call to cancel this listener. So save it in a variable so you can call it later. One last thing to note here is that if one of these documents changes, Firestore the database will send that newer version of the document over to my client. And then my client will combine that new document with the cached versions it already has and send my listener callback the entire list of 20 documents again. And that's usually what you want. It means that if I were, say, converting this list of documents into a group of list elements that I could display on screen, I can just rebuild this group every time and not worry about any conditional logic here around like, oh, was this document changed or added or so on. Um, but you can always get at that specific change data if you need it. So those are the basics or, you know, the fundamentals of Firestore on the web. Uh, but let me leave you with a few quick notes before I go. Uh, first, as I mentioned earlier, if I were to use the Firebase Firestore Lite library, that will reduce my imported code size between like 60 to 80%, but I won't have access to things like offline support, latency compensation, or those fancy real-time listeners. In fact, you can see here, it's telling me that my on snapshot call is no longer defined, which is sad, so I'm gonna go back. Uh, second, as I mentioned earlier, my security rules are currently set up so that anybody out there can delete my entire database. Uh, that's definitely something I should fix and a factor I should be considering now while I'm still designing my database instead of, say, two days before I launch. And third, if you're worried about messing with production data or just want to save a little money as you're developing, try running against the emulators. Um, this involves installing the emulator from the Firebase CLI tool, which you can do by typing Firebase init or I think Firebase init emulator, starting it up by calling Firebase emulator start, and then pointing your code to the emulator like so. And finally, if you have more questions around how to structure your data, how security rules work, how pricing works, or just about anything else, I kind of recommend checking out the Get to Know Cloud Firestore series. It's pretty good, but you know, I am a little biased there. So those are the fundamentals for adding Firestore to your web application. Hey, if you like this video, why not subscribe to our YouTube channel? You'll get to be the first on your block to know when we've added a new video. And if you want to see more videos like this, make sure to check out the Firebase Fundamentals playlist. We'll be adding more videos to that as time goes on. So thank you very much for watching. I will see you soon and happy coding.